I'm William Branham, and this is Win the Day with James Whitaker. You're listening to Win the Day with James Whitaker. What we do in life echoes in eternity. Broadcasting from Los Angeles, California, here's your host, James Whitaker. Hey, winners. Welcome back to Win the Day, where we sit down with some of the world's true change makers to give you all the tips, tools, and strategies to win the day every day. The quote for this episode comes from Admiral William McRaven and says, if you can't do the little things right, you'll never do the big things right. We've got a very special treat for you today. Joining me in the studio is William Branham, a Navy SEAL with 26 years of service under his belt. William served on both traditional SEAL teams, taught as a SEAL sniper instructor, and served on teams that specialized in undersea operations where the missions could only be approved by the President of the United States. In addition, he led major combat operations ranging from direct action missions to protecting the interim Iraqi elected officials. After retiring from the military in 2018, William came to grips with the physical and psychological symptoms that were negatively impacting his well-being and quality of life, symptoms that he'd attempted to mask with alcohol and prescription drugs. That journey led him to becoming the founder and CEO of Naked Warrior Recovery, a CBD company focused on the recovery of veterans and first responders. In this episode, we'll speak with William about the most grueling moments of SEAL training, the secrets to discipline and motivation, his difficult transition to civilian life, and the best lessons from his 26-year career as a Navy SEAL. Before we begin, remember that the right bit of inspiration can completely change the trajectory of someone's life. So if there's a friend or loved one out there who needs to hear this episode or could use some help to win the day, share it with them right now and hit the follow or subscribe button so you can get access to episodes like this one as soon as they are released. I'm pumped for this. Let's win the day with Navy SEAL William Branham. William, great to see you, my friend. Thanks for coming on the show. Yeah, for sure. Thanks for having me out here. First of all, thank you for your service. You've sacrificed so much, you know, in 26 years of service. Uh, so really appreciate you taking the time to share yeah. a lot of the lessons and a bit yeah. about your journey today. Yeah, thank you. And also a big shout out to our mutual friend, Tim Bent, Beanland, right. who I know is watching this and putting us in touch. Uh, when you were younger, take us right back. What, what career path did you naturally gravitate towards? I naturally graduated, uh, graduated, gravitated towards the, um, towards the military. You know, I grew up in in Mississippi, a little town outside of Meridian, Mississippi. It's not a lot going on there, but I was heavily involved in the Boy Scouts. And uh, I really liked the outdoors. I like shooting guns. I like swimming. I thought I liked swimming until I joined the SEAL teams. It's a <laughs> yeah, degree. There's levels, isn't there, right. of swimming? Um, <laughs> like and love. And I I don't think I like or love uh, that anymore. <laughs> I still do it just because it's hard and it scares me a little bit, uh, especially in Hawaii where there's big fish with big teeth. Um, but I was on a, a national jamboree. I was a very poor kid, so the, the, but heavily involved in the scouts. So the scouts actually paid for me to go to this national jamboree up in, up in Virginia. And uh, I met another kid, and he was like, I'm going to be an F-14 Tomcat pilot, and I'm going to be a Navy SEAL when I grow up. And I always knew that I wanted to be some sort of elite special forces something, but I didn't know what that was. There was no internet, you know, when I was a kid. There was, we have three channels on the television. Um, but I did watch a lot of John Wayne movies. He was a Green Beret in Vietnam in the movie Green Berets. He was, uh, John Rambo was a, uh, um, he was an army ranger. Uh, let's see, Chuck Norris. He was, uh, he was in this movie called Delta Force mm -hmm. and they were shooting rockets off of dirt bikes. I still haven't had a chance to do that. <laughs> Seems really cool. I still want to do that. Still young. Well, we, um, we got the whole day ahead of us. I, we, we, got, we, got, yeah, we got all day. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then, uh, and so you know, I was thinking maybe I would be like a, a Marine Corps scout sniper. I kind of knew what those were. Uh, and the Marines had super cool commercials where they were like fighting dragons with swords and shields on, <laughs> on television. I was like, well, that's pretty cool. Uh, but w when this kid told me about Navy SEALs, I was like, what is that? He was like, oh, they're the most elite military force in the world. It's the hardest military training, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and they jump out of airplanes. They shoot guns. They scuba dive. They do all these things. I'm like, check, sign me up. Where is the, like, whatever. I came back from that trip and like two weeks later, the Navy recruiter called my house. This was the summer between my 11th and 12th grade of high school. He called, calls my house and says, hey, have you ever thought about joining the Navy? If he had called me six weeks ahead of time, I would have said, not on your life. Like my, everyone in my family has been in the Navy. And I'm like, there's no way. They have the ugliest uniforms. It's like the great things floating out in the ocean, not joining the Navy. Uh, and then, you know, but the Navy is the only organization that has Navy SEALs. So I was like, yeah, I want to be a Navy SEAL and an F-14 Tomcat pilot. <laughs> so um, 
so I, he said, come on down and let's talk about it. And so I went down, he showed me a super cheesy movie. And I was like, that's what I want to do. That's where do I sign? So <laughs> that was kind of the movies were a great recruitment tool. I mean, look right? at Top, exactly. Top Gun. Yeah, 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 yeah. And it's coming out again this summer. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the SEAL training buds, you know, notoriously difficult. Take us into how grueling that was for you. Um, it was very hard. So when I went through it, it was six months long and it took me a short 13 months to get through that, that six month block of training. <laughs> um, and it wasn't because I didn't want to be there. I wanted to be there probably more than most people. Uh, but I didn't prepare myself mm. physically before I got there. And then when I got there, I got injured several times and that, you know, they kept rolling me back because of those injuries. But what I, they almost kicked me out. So the first time I got hurt, they, you know, it's natural for people to get hurt or whatever. Okay. They, they roll you back to the next class. Um, so I rolled back to the next class and then I got hurt about three weeks in still not sure what the injury was. Like my leg just stopped working and the, you know, you go before this sort of medical review board and they're all old senior seals and they recommend you stay or go. And the first guy I went to, he said, I recommend you go back to the, back to the fleet, go right on a ship. And I was like, hold on. That's not on, that's not in my plan. I don't want to do that. I, because I, I had to ride on a ship for two years before getting to seal training. And so I go see the second guy and I'm like really depressed. And because of some decisions that I made before I got to seal training that landed me on a ship in Yokosuka, Japan, um, I almost didn't get to go become a Navy SEAL because apparently I went to a school that made me too critical for the Navy. Mm -hmm. Like it was like, and when it was time for my time to be on the ship to be up, I called the guy that says, you can go to your next ship. And I said, Hey, I want to go become a Navy SEAL. He said, sorry, you're too critical to the Navy. That, that school that you went to for four more months to get in better shape, to go to SEAL training, you thought that landed you on the ship. Uh, that makes you too critical for me to let you go to become a Navy SEAL. And so the, so the chief of Naval operations, who's the most senior guy in the, in the Navy, like the only people who are more senior to him is the secretary of defense and the president of the United States. Mm. He came to my little ship in Yokosuka, Japan, and he was, he had, you know, he didn't go to any other ship, only my little ship and, uh, had CNO's call. And he said, is it, you know, this is my vision of the, the Navy, blah, blah, whatever. I have no idea what he said. And then he said, does anyone have any questions? I was the second person he called on. And I said, Hey, I joined the Navy to become a Navy SEAL. I think I deserve a chance to go. My detailer won't let me go. He says, I'm too critical. What do you think? What do you think? <laughs> and so he was like, he turns to my commanding officer and he's like, is he a good guy? And my CO says, yes, he was a sailor of the quarter this quarter, which is kind of like employee of the month because I did a good job sweeping or something. I'm not really <laughs> sure. Um, so he turns back to me and says, check, you'll be in the first class after your, your PRD, your plan rotational date. Six weeks later, I'm off to California to SEAL training. Amazing. Blasted so through that middle road bureaucracy straight away. Right. And so uh, cut right through, went right, pretty much right to the top. Um, and so the second guy that I went to see, I'm like, I'm like crying. I'm like, tears are pouring down my face. I'm like, you know jittery lip and i'm like please don't let me go like i like if i leave i may not have an opportunity to come back because you know it took the cno to get me here today what are the odds that he's going to come back to right yeah <laughs> and they run back into him but I, you know i know you let me go but and i got hurt and they kicked me out and i'm I wanted, so he uh so the second guy said go stand outside i'll be right back he left for like three and a half hours yeah. i'm standing outside on my crutches still crying like oh my god what's my what's going to happen next he came back like three and a half later, hours later. He's like, what are you doing here? I'm like, you told me to wait outside. I'll do whatever I need to do. And uh, he's like, go check in and you'll be in the next class. We're going we're gonna to roll you. I'm like, okay, awesome. Okay. And uh, so I never healed up. And I pretty much just had to limp my way all the way through up until Hell Week. At that time, Hell Week was week number five or six. I don't remember. They keep changing the, 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 the days of when Hell Week starts. Um, and so I, but I had to pass enough events to make it to Hell Week because they will kick you out if you don't meet the standard, mm -hmm. uh, at least the minimum standard. And um, so I remember like I was failing the four mile time runs. And I remember one day I was like, I just, I woke up and I was like, I'm gonna crush this thing today. And so it was a run after lunch. I stayed back from lunch because you run hundreds of miles a week. Um, you know, between like the, 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 the training events that you do, but you run six miles a day just to eat. You run a mile to the galley, you eat, you run a mile back to the compound, a mile for lunch and a mile 
back and I'm out for dinner and I'm all back. So I just stayed back from lunch. I helped prepare the boats for the event that we were going to have after the four mile time run. And it was just like something in my mind, I just clicked and I was like, I'm, mm. I'm going to crush this thing today. Mm. Thank the Lord that happened because that, that was the one event that helped get me to hell week. And then throughout hell week, hell week is five and a half days of, of, you know, you of absolute misery. You don't sleep. They don't let you sleep. Um, actually they let us sleep for about two and a half, three hours on Wednesday night, Thursday morning. And when they woke us up that Thursday morning, that was probably the most terrible thing they could have done. Because I remember like we're in a tent, we're finally dry for the first time in the week in like the three or four days I had stopped moving. So my body started to kind of like shut down and like to start that healing process and start swelling up. And then they come in like, we told you not to sleep. And of course we're you can't not sleep. It's warm. I'm laying down. I'm not moving. And I haven't slept for three and a half days. And, uh, and I, I run outside and I look and I'm like, where did everybody go? Like, I did, that's the first time I realized we'd lost so many people. So in SEAL training, you lose about 70% of the people from day one up until hell week. And then hell week, you lose about 70% more of whoever's left over. And then of those people who graduate hell week, you, you have about 80% of those people actually graduate. So you still lose people along the way for different reasons. Um, but I remember like it was super foggy, Southern California. People think that it's nice and warm and toasty and the water's warm and the water's uh, not warm at all. Um, <laughs> it was foggy. I couldn't even see the water and the water was maybe 50 yards away. Mm. And, uh, and I was like, where did everybody go? And then they were like, yeah, all right, because you guys suck so bad and you slept, we told you not to sleep. Go hit the surf. And I was like, oh, I don't want to get in the water. And I remember grabbing myself, like physically, grabbed my uniform and I was like, oh, throw myself in the water. I'm like, okay, <laughs> I'm good now. But yeah, that was my like, it wasn't a point of weakness, but a point of like, I don't want to do this. <laughs> the whole rest of my time there, I was like, I want to do this. I yeah. like I don't I mean, it was hard. It was absolutely miserable. And I was going through Hell Week broken, but somehow during Hell Week I healed up and like mm. I was good to go after that. Uh, you mentioned the statistics there on people quitting. There's the infamous brass bell that just sits yeah. there. Can you take us into the bell and just the mental battle that is for the, the candidates who were there? Um, yeah, so there's a, a bell that sits outside of the, so how, um, Buds is broken up into f four phases. The fourth phase, which is actually the first phase, is like kind of the preparation phase. And then the actual first phase is called first phase, and there's a bell that sits outside. And there are a set of footprints that sit in front of that bell. So you can be out and they have a bell that they carry with them. So you can be out, you know, laying out in the ocean, like shivering miserably. And if you decide to quit, you can get up and you can go ring the bell, but you don't ring it once you ring it three times. But then after you quit, you go and you put on like a clean uniform with your helmet and you go to the first phase office and then you ring the bell three times. And then you take your helmet off and you put it in line. And, and I, you know, I travel around and I give presentations on, on sort of the get naked mindset. And they, so, it, and the, the secret is, is, uh, naked is, is an acronym and the N stands for never quit. And in that presentation, I have a picture of like the bell and like a line of like 150 green helmets of all these guys that have quit. And you would like, you would like, it's not easy to get to SEAL training, yeah. but they like, I don't, we still don't understand what has someone stay and what has someone yeah. not want to be there. You mentioned preparation earlier that you felt like you weren't adequately prepared for the yeah. training. It seems to be the same statistics of dropouts and everything else. And with so much more information available, why aren't more people better prepared to go through it? Do they do, they do such a great job of mixing up the training so it just gets worse and worse or, or what is that like how do people not prepare as it's, it's a really good question because i think we have a higher candidate of of student come in now mm. i mean i remember in some of my leadership roles in the seal teams i had a guy that was a he was a doctor on the outside he came in as an enlisted seal like not an officer like he should have been he was like the quickest way for me to become a seal is to go to buds at you know as if i don't have a degree and um, go through the training and he made it. I had another guy that was a aeronautical engineer. He used to work for NASA. Mm. And he was like, I wanna go become a Navy SEAL. 
So I was like, when these guys were working for me, I'm like, I'm not qualified. Like, <laughs> you're like highly educated. I have a PhD, a public high school diploma. And you're like so much more educated than I am. But I've worked I, on zero spaceships. And right, exactly. Zero I'm like zero medically. people. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, but I think people, now it's very, it's very sexy. It's very Hollywood, very like in your face. Mm. And I think that people see that and they don't recognize the the true discipline that it is required to to complete that kind of training the passion the desire like it has to be in your heart mm. it's not in your mind i mean it's in your mind but it has to be in your heart and if you're not willing to accept failure along the way you're because you're going to fail i mean i i saw guys that were absolute studs like i looked up to them i was like you like this is easy for you would quit because they didn't like the water the water was too cold or um, they couldn't stand the thought of being told they weren't good enough. Mm. Wow. Like they're used to winning in everything in their life and they couldn't stand the thought of being told you suck. Mm. Oh yeah, you won, no, you lost. Yeah, no, that push up didn't count. That pull up didn't count. And they it broke them on the inside. Mm. Wow. Um it's crazy, isn't it? I, I just want to be really clear on that there. There were people say so you you perhaps felt inferior just looking at the physical and even some of the amazing things these people had achieved yeah. beforehand, that made you feel like, wow, what am I even doing here? Or I've, I've maybe even got no chance. But through the, the background and the, the mental tenacity and persistence that you had, you were able to beat all these people who on paper or visually looked like they would be right. much better candidates. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, it, it was weird to me to see people quit. I was yeah. like, why, why would you quit? <laughs> it's so much work just to get here. Yeah. And the consequences of quitting... As you go to the regular Navy and, you know, just like what, and I already spent time in the regular Navy and I was like, that was way more punishment than, you know, whatever we're doing here. This is fun. You'll have to carry me out of I here. I mean, it sucks. Yeah. I'm, the only way I'm leaving is like on a stretcher out the, you know, out the back door. Uh, they're looking for the people. So as you mentioned there, they're looking for the people who don't quit, the people who who want it the most, no matter what's going on. Um, but as part of that, you're in these small groups trying to do better than the other groups that are that are there sure. in the training. What are you doing to form that camaraderie and that bond as quickly as possible to make sure that you beat those other those other groups? So while I was in SEAL training for 13 months, I went through the first phase three times. And in the beginning, I was building these bonds with, with guys. And, um, and then they would quit. And I was like, what, what happened? Why, what, I, don't, I don't understand it. So at some point, I became pretty callous, pretty cold. Like I still wanted to have bonds with guys. But if a guy wanted to quit, get, there's the door. Mm. Like I would help push them along. Like you don't, you're in my way right now. You're slowing me down. I want to actually win races. And in Hell Week, I saw a boat crew that was winning every race from like, you know, Sunday night into like Monday. And I'm like, I want to be, I'm like, these guys are holding me back. I want to be with winners. Yeah. And so at uh, Monday afternoon before dinner, we had lost so many people that they had to reshuffle the boat crews and you get in a boat crew based on your height. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, I'm going to do what I need to do right now to be with a bunch surrounded by winners. I want to be in boat crew three. I'm, I'm right at six foot. And again, it was by height. So boat crew one is all the big guys, boat crew two, more big guys, but not quite as big as boat crew one. Boat crew three is, you know, our average guys. And I got into that boat crew. So what I did is like, you have seven guys in the boat crew. So I was like, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. That's boat crew one, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. one, two, three, four, five. I'm the number six, and then whoever's number seven. <laughs> and uh, that's how I stayed in that boat crew. Smart, yeah. <laughs> and when we, um, and when I got in there and I looked around, I was like, everybody was just average, regular guy mm -hmm. in that boat crew. There were no superstars. But no matter what we were doing, if we were just like going to chow or we were doing an actual race, like by me surrounding myself with guys that were performing better than me that brought me up to a, up to their like I had to like raise my own bar to their level mm. even though I would feel sorry for myself and kind of want to slow down or whatever I'm like if I slow down then I'm letting them down and I'm slowing them down mm. and now they're dragging me I'm not going to be that guy so that was part of my uh, uh, my just my desire to be there and it helped change my own mindset because I didn't I wasn't really surrounded by people like that growing up 
there were like the star athletes, the star, you know, students, and there was me. And I was like, I'm not as good as any of those people. But if I want to be with those people, I have to like push myself beyond what I think my limits are. And there's something I've heard you say before, if you're going to suffer, at least suffer at the front of the suffer in the front. The yeah, hundred percent. That was, that was, I learned that lesson in that boat crew. Yeah. Suffer How in week the front. sucks. Powerful. You're going to suffer. It doesn't matter what you're doing in life and entrepreneurship in relationships. It's better to, you're going to suffer at some point. It's better to suffer in the front than it is to suffer in the back because when you suffer in the front, you're going to finish more quickly. You're going to get there a lot faster. If you suffer in the back, it's just going to take you that much longer and it still sucks. Was it ever verbalized for the people who were about to quit? Were they ever like, look, I'm just, I'm not feeling it. Or I feel like I'm, you know, maybe this is the day for me. Or were those people just ghost out of there? Um, again, I was, a lot of times I didn't even see when people quit. Yeah. They were just not there anymore. Yeah. Wow. Because I, I guess I was just so focused on like, I just got to get through this yeah. next evolution, like one more, like small victory at a time. And would that give you confidence knowing that you were still there, still standing? I think so. Yeah. Yeah. I don't, I don't think I thought about it like that. It was like, well, okay, I've made it one more day. Okay. This is the furthest I've made it. I don't know what to expect from here on out. <laughs> yeah. So I made it again. Yeah. So, Mine yeah. the wrong spot. <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, like, no one oh, else here. The, the guys I want to be around, surrounded by are still here. So yeah. <laughs> Once you officially became a SEAL and you were sent on your first combat mission, was it excitement, nerves, and how did you pre prepare for that that moment mentally? Prepare? I didn't really know what I was prepared for. Mm. Um, because when I came in, there was no combat operations. We de When we deployed, we deployed to either ride on a ship to do like counter, um, to, to board other ships that maybe carrying weapons or paraphernalia or contraband from other countries or, you know, counter piracy kind of operations. We also deployed to Europe to train with other special forces uh, and kind of share tactics, techniques and procedures. And then after 9-11, we started deploying to combat. We started deploying to Afghanistan first and later to Iraq. And so my first combat deployment was to Afghanistan. And and I actually deployed there in a in an administrative role because I was part of I was part of the headquarters at the time and they needed people to do these admin jobs in Afghanistan. I'm like, okay, sure. I'll go. Like if I'm not there, I'm not relevant. Mm. So I went there. I eventually got out and I was with the, with the actual uh, seal platoon that was there. I was a seal, but I was, you know, headquarters and I'm like, I'll be, I'll drive, I'll be security. I'll do whatever I need to do just, just to be for action. Yeah. yeah. I just like, I want to be a part of it. I want I need to learn from it because I know my next, my next um, position is going to be at the seal team in a leadership role. I feel like I should have some experience under my belt in combat in order to like fulfill that role as as a combat as a leader training guys to and leading guys into combat. Mm. And I remember the guy that was in charge of that platoon that I kind of joined up with uh and he was like this is like what I've always wanted to do is I would lead men in combat. I'm like I never really thought about that and so now I'm thinking about it. So so really it was it was survive you know, learn as much as I could from this group of people. My first time in combat, it was their first time in combat as well. Yeah. Um, but really it was a, it was a learning experience. And, and as long as I continued to embrace the learning experience, I would only get better. How about the culture shock being dropped into a literal war zone, places like Afghanistan and, and Iraq? It was weird because unless you were involved in a gunfight or something like that, when you're like driving around the country, you just see like regular people like Afghanistan. I was like, well, oh, this is not, this is like a fourth world country, like way below third world country. Like they're poor, but they're like kids playing, you know, soccer and wearing brightly colored clothes and they live in mud huts. And I, I can't even like describe like how terrible of living experience that is, but that's how they live and they survive. And I'm like, this is like, that was probably more weird than actually being in combat. Cause we trained to be in combat. Yeah. But to interact with these people that were that lived like this, the first time I came back from Afghanistan, I was like, "We have so much opulence here. Yeah. Like we waste so much. I can't even believe it." Mm -hmm. And so the same thing for Iraq. Iraq, they're you know more, uh, more of a metropolis, if you will, but mm -hmm. still you know bad construction, not good. Like it's not the same standard. Mm -hmm. uh, but out in the, the out outside of Baghdad. Certainly not Afghanistan. They they have more stuff, more 
infrastructure more infrastructure for sure yeah but uh, still very poor very you know i think just being in combat because we trained for it was easy uh some of the stuff that we did was not easy and some of the situations that we found ourselves in was not easy but i think just like the culture from like being in the united states or in europe or wherever and then being in one of those countries was like holy how do people live like this yeah uh, is there language training as part of that? Like if you're going there and you find yourself in a situation where you maybe need to read something or, or communicate with someone? There, there, there is language training. I've never really had any. Um, every time I've deployed, I, I learned some of the language, but we usually take translators with us yeah. to help with, you know, documents or interrogation in the battlefield or things like that. Yeah. Mm, interesting. Uh, a question that I've been thinking about for days in advance of this is this one question that I just always kept coming back to that I really wanted to ask you. What was the moment you won that self-worth battle after what you've shared about, like where you grew up and all those things? That self-worth battle where you realized and acknowledged, yes, I'm a SEAL. Yes, I'm elite. Yes, I belong here. I think I still battle that. <laughs> a little bit of impo imposter syndrome? 100%, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Wow, I was actually I was thinking about that right before the show, and I actually was writing um, kind of a email or an email about it yesterday on the yeah. airplane. Yeah. Um, and and I, I certainly do, but I've, you know, I think that that's like a something that I'm turning into a superpower. Mm. And what I've what I what I realized is the preparation it it's causes me to put more into the preparation of something mm. whether it's you know preparing for a podcast mm. preparing to speak in front of a, a, a crowd of people a, a business um or pretty much anything else in my life a physical event you know we talked about doing the murph earlier i wasn't prepared to do that but i <laughs> maintain a level of physical fitness yeah. that helped me get through that uh, that event, um, that already, this, this so when someone hands right, you a white vest, you know, my, I have like a, a little, my little gym is out in my, in my driveway and my neighbors, you know, walk by, walk their dogs and, and, uh, and they're like, why do you work so hard? Or I drag a tire around the neighborhood. It's, you know, why are you dragging that? Well, it's not going to drag itself. Uh, I'm just taking my tire for a walk. No big deal. So, and someone was like, why do you, why are you doing that? I'm like, well, because I want to be hard to kill. I want to be very, you know, I don't want to be an easy target ever. Yeah. And so, but it's just really, it's about preparation. It's yeah. mental preparation. It's physical preparation. Because when you do hard things, when hard things happen to you, you're more prepared, whether it's physically or mentally or emotionally. Mm, soft things make soft people. And right. Yeah. Yeah. I absolutely love that. Uh, you specialize in undersea operations for a, a big part of that, where the missions can only be approved by the president. What's an example of a, of a mission like that? There are strategically important uh, things that we need uh, as the United States that we would go and we would go and figure those things out mm. or go and find or go and see and report back. Mm. So that would be <laughs> – well, so before before the Iraq war, there were reports of, you know, like the special – being from Australia originally, mm -hmm. um, there were reports of like the Special Air Service, the British SAS, who would go in there, secure, um, you know, all the oil things and, and right. that type of thing. Is, is it part of that sort of uh, pre-war things that would happen or is it – Those were some of it. Those yeah. were some of the things. So, you know, in early Iraq, you know, we might have used one of those small undersea vehicles to, to get into an area to – yeah. To gather some intelligence, drop something off, maybe put something on the side of a mm. vessel that we want to track mm. or something like that. Yeah. So, but, but the, the reason that it has to be approved at such a high level is because of the strategic importance mm. and because of the, the consequences of failure. Mm. Failure means that potentially, you know, my face is on Al Jazeera mm. in some place that I maybe shouldn't be. So the reason that it gets that level of approval is the president of the United States is accepting the risk of yeah. these potential consequences. Yeah. Oh, okay. Gotcha. So um, so the probability, like if the sacrifice is worth right. the, the um, success of the mission. And we would call those no-fail no, no missions. Like you, yeah. the, a failure is not an option doing something like this. So, yeah. um, so the preparation that goes into the mission planning and uh, and the mission execution, you know, we will we will plan every possible contingency along the way mm -hmm. to make sure that you know if something happens, this is how we're going to handle it. Mm -hmm. From from you know, someone dies in the back of the, there's an emergency 
if one of the guys in the back of the boat, well, if we're in like an enemy harbor somewhere doing something, well, we're not going to surface the boat. Sorry, I, you know, mm. we have to handle that on the backside. Mm. Yeah, it's um, it's a really interesting and um, crazy role that I feel like people just have absolutely zero context of all these other things that are that are going on to what's that quote you know people sleep safely in their beds because people are out there um doing bad things on, right. on their behalf to make the world a safe place something like that yeah yeah, yeah absolutely uh you mentioned the high performing individuals uh, i think you mentioned boat three earlier yeah you go into the teams and you're around these other just absolute you know weapons i'm sure great relationships with the special forces yeah. of other countries like you mentioned how motivating is it to be around those other high performing individuals super super motivating i mean i now that i'm out of the seal teams i still do my best to surround myself with um high performers mm -hmm. you know one of the things that my so my transition from the military to civilian life was like really the hardest military mission i've ever been on mm -hmm. and i kind of equate it to if you've ever seen the movie the avengers where thanos like snaps his fingers and half the world's population goes away and everyone's like what happened that was how I felt when I left the military. Mm -hmm. I was like, I had a, I had a badass team, a badass mission, and a badass purpose. And when I left the military, I had no team, I had no mission, and I had no purpose. Mm -hmm. So I've had to like kind of rebuild that and bring that back to where I want it, to where I feel like I have mission and a purpose, and I'm surrounding myself with high performers mm -hmm. to build my my new SEAL team. Mm -hmm. You, you mentioned, uh, we've mentioned a couple of movies today and, and obviously beforehand as well. How well do these movies like Lone Survivor and American Sniper and a lot of these other movies, how well do they capture the essence of, of what it would be like on the, on the ground and that unpredictability? I haven't, I haven't watched them. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Is that a conscious decision? Probably, yeah. yeah. I mean, I've seen things on TV and I'm like, I can't watch that. Yeah. That's wrong. What are they doing? I, yeah. You know, I, I can't not critique it, so, yeah. so better to not drive myself crazy <laughs> for sure i've seen some of those even when they obviously get the um uh former seals to go and help with a lot of these these things as mm -hmm. consultants but they've still got the networks who just do right. their best to butcher and make this stuff sure. so like just weak um yeah I, I i like some more of the more of the hardcore ones just to yeah make it it's funny real. there i guess there's a movie there's a, a tv series called seal teams mm -hmm. and one of my business coaches He's like, how how real is it? I'm like, I have no idea. I've never seen it. I, I can't I can't tell you. I don't know. But what I can tell you is it's it's not as sexy as it looks on TV. Yeah, <laughs> there are some parts that are super awesome, but what they don't show is all the work and preparation and and struggle that goes into it. Like yeah. everything in the SEAL teams is not sexy. Mm. It's a lot of work and a lot of failure and a lot of admin stuff in order to do that one percent of sexiness. Like there's a lot of work and time and effort that goes into it. Mm. And then, but if you did a good job on, you know, that 99% part, that 1%, that 1% is super fun yeah. and super cool. If you're a business owner and want a copy of the 10 biggest mistakes business owners make with their podcast, go to mistakes.wearepodcast.com or click the link in the show notes. It's a free download and we'll show you everything you need to do to start getting a massive ROI from your podcast so you can help a lot more people, get recognized as the authority in your industry and scale your business faster than ever. All right, let's get back into the fun. There's an article I read when I was in high school and it was talking about Australia's involvement in the East Timor, um, you know, a lot of things that were happening there in that country. There was an SAS guy who was shot in the news article was talking about how he was shot in the neck, was able to fix his wound, realized he wasn't going to die and could get back in the back in the fight. When there are situations like that, how do you even prepare for like, how do you train if preparation is such a big thing? Mm -hmm. How do you prepare to potentially take a hit and, and still, you know, be um, in the fight? I think it's mindset. It's, and again, that goes back to training, like in the, in the first place, it just, just going through SEAL training or going through, uh, you know, the Green Beret Q course or things like that. You're surrounded by people who have already done it. All of the instructors, they've already done it. When you get to the SEAL teams, they all went through the same training that you've went, gone through and we're always raising the bar. So when we, you know, there's a saying, the more you sweat in training, the less you bleed in combat and that's absolutely true you know we we raise the bar on training i think probably more than other units just because i mean we do force on force training with paint rounds and not not 
live rounds because we don't want to kill one another. But um, you certainly get into real gunfights with other SEALs on the training side who are your opposition force, and they're trying to take you down. And you get hit, and then you still have to, like, move forward and still attack the target until you take a, whatever, life-threatening or whatever. You're shot in the face, mm. and you take a knee or get back up and keep going. But it, it's building that mentality of it doesn't matter how much it sucks, you have to keep pushing through the pain, and you have to, you have to eliminate the enemy. Because if you quit somewhere out there, that's just part of, like, that no-quit attitude. Mm. If you quit just because you got shot, um, unless you're completely out of the fight and you can't fight back, then how did you even get that far mm. along the way? I, I gave a speech before this event called the Murph, this workout called the Murph uh, a few days ago. And it was, you know, Lieutenant Michael Murphy, who was a SEAL, you know, he was shot in the stomach and then he still was able to get up and climb on top of, a, you know, the highest peak he could to make the call for hopefully a rescue mission. And where he was like, you know, completely exposed himself to the enemy. And then he was shot again. But he still, after he was shot again, he still continued to fight. I remember uh, a young lieutenant in Afghanistan. He stepped on an IED. He lost his leg. He still was fighting. He was still um, giving orders on the battle. He lost his leg. Mm -hmm. And until the morphine, like, tourniquet, okay, I'm still directing traffic. I'm still leading. I'm still fighting. And until the morphine kicked in and the platoon chief had to relieve him of duty because once the morphine kicks in, he's, he's not there mm -hmm. as well anymore. Uh, your, you know, your, your judgment is impaired at that point. But even though he was missing a leg, he was still completely in the fight and fighting and, and going after it, um, until he was not allowed to anymore. And so it's just a mindset. It's like, you know, I think we all can have it. You've seen, you, you know, heard stories about, whatever like how the adrenaline kicked in where mm -hmm. a mother like lifted a car off of her Superhuman. child or whatever yeah. like yeah you're like there we all have the ability to continue to fight even when things are not good we just have to make the conscious effort to tap into that yeah you mentioned that your job as an active seal is to raise the bar and you're surrounded by the mentors who are really asking you to do something they're not asking you to do something that they haven't done or been right. willing to do themselves is that right yeah gee the power and inspiration around that group of just and obviously you mentioned some of the what the elite training translates to on the battlefield and, right. and how you get such a and you know one of the cool things about the seal teams is you know even guys that were junior to me they would raise me up maybe i would show up and i would have an off day mm. they would i would show up and they would hold me to a higher standard. <laughs> like, what's, yeah. what's up? <laughs> you, it's time to work. I'm like, you're right. Let's go. Yeah. It's time to work. Yeah. Um, because I would, obviously I would hold them to a higher standard. So yeah. that was, it was awesome being surrounded by that, that camaraderie, you know, even going back to, you know, boat crew three and hell week, like they held me to a higher standard. And so, you know, I, I know without a doubt that every one of those guys had moments of weakness, mm. but we weren't going to let one another down. And there was no written, or spoken agreement in the boat crew, it was just the desire to win. It was the desire to be in the front, mm. to suffer in the front. Mm. I love it. Uh, last year, Afghanistan had this very, I don't wanna get political here, but you know, Afghanistan had this very public power transfer back to the, the Taliban as US forces had withdrawn after, after 20 years. Uh, weapons, armor were seized, all those types of things. Taliban rules were brought back in recently. Uh, girls, the, the rule was that girls are now banned from attending school after the sixth grade. Um, that being said, the US obviously can't stay there forever. And you know, 20 years is a long, long time with a, a great, great cost as well. Uh, how do you feel about the timing and effectiveness of that withdrawal? And would anyone in the teams um, would that affect their mentality with future conflicts in that in that region? Well, that's a tough question. Mm. Um, I think every single person in the teams, they will go back and do it all over again and hope that the leadership makes better decisions than the decisions that were made mm. to pull out in the way that we pulled out. Yeah, mm. I can I can certainly <laughs> go down that road and rant, but I would, yeah. It's, uh, yeah, it was that was a failure of leadership on many levels. I think it's important to share that because most people just read whatever news source they're from, confirmation bias, you know, on, right. on either side. And then they've, it's, it's nice to go straight to the source to hear these things right. as well. Yeah, I mean, it was absolutely leadership failure. The intel agencies 
they knew what was going on. There was a right way and a wrong way. Certainly we could have pulled out at the exact same moment, but it was the way that we pulled out mm. is really the, I think the biggest issue. Mm. Mm. You've mentioned some of the sacrifices and, and things that you've been involved in and, and seen. I mean, I can only imagine after 26 years of, of, of your career as well, when you come back home and you see people who aren't aware of these sacrifices or taking life for granted or even worse, you know, they're just not doing things to, or they're, they're doing things actively damage society. How does, how do you feel about those people? Is it just a matter of taking the good with the bad or does it, does it sort of hurt you a little bit to see some people not recognize how, grateful they should be to live in a country like America or, or Australia? I think it's, yeah. Um, I think we have very short attention spans. Mm. And I think we rely too heavily on the media. Like the media, if you've ever seen like how a coup works, the military, they come, you know, they rise up in the, or they come from out of the country and into the country to take over. The first place they go is to the news organization. And then they go to the capital. They take over those two places first, and then they're able to control the population. If you control the, the narrative, then you control the population. So the Capitol is just a building, mm -hmm. but it's a symbol of authority. The media is a symbol of knowledge, mm -hmm. if you will. And, you know, 9-11 was almost 21 years ago. I remember exactly where I was when 9-11 happened. I remember like how the world thought about the United States. Mm -hmm. And I know how the people of the United States thought about the United States. I'm sure Australia was the same. They're like, we got, we got your back. Yeah. And I know I've fought with Australians in Iraq and in Afghanistan. Um, I think the, you know, the media has an agenda and their agenda is to sell stuff, sell news, sell fear. And, you know, I'll give you an example. I hadn't watched the news in years, mostly because when I was in Afghanistan, I was part of operations. And then I saw the news stories that came out from those operations. My job was to like lead men in combat and then go into combat and do those things. I did not care what the media had to say. I didn't, it wasn't like a conscious effort, but I knew that the media reported things incorrectly. Mm. And then, uh, you know, a couple of years ago before this last election, I had no idea that people had such disdain for Trump. I'm like, whatever, he's a president. He says weird stuff on tweeting and whatever. And I, <laughs> I, I can see like weird little headlines. I'm like, whatever, that, you, that's, you, know, you already knew who that was. Mm. Um, and then someone was like, and I'm like, I'm you know, supporting patriots and first responders. And like, someone was like, well, you don't wanna be a Trumper, do you? I'm like, what's a Trumper? What does that even mean? Like I had no, like, no idea that there was all this and I think it's like interesting that people are still talking about hmm. the man that's not in office anymore. Yeah. Yeah. If you say one thing, they automatically associate that with a hundred other negative Right. How, what, what's what's going the... on here? Yeah. Like, but yeah, I mean, we forget, we, we only care about what the media is telling us today. Yeah. And we listen to the media. Uh, we have very short attention spans. I mean, TikTok is like the biggest growing platform yeah. in the world. Mm -hmm. And you know, I you know, I post videos on TikTok, and I my average view is like twenty six seconds for my high performing videos, and and it's just me like sharing you know the Navy Seal mindset, and uh, but that's really our our gen this this current generation of the way we consume media is you know we're very short attention span, mm -hmm. and that's how we that's how we focus on on everything. Yeah. Stokes division, doesn't it? The the short attention span and and pursuit of confirmation bias, right? Is um is tough. right. It's that like that instant gratification. Yeah, like, we forgot about like work and work ethic and yeah. doing hard things and like having goals. We just like oh like I can order ice cream by hitting a button on my phone <laughs> and have it delivered to my house. You know? Yeah. I I remember making ice cream with my grandparents <laughs> and the thing like the electric thing and with the ice and the salt and the cream and the whatever and it eventually made ice cream it took hours to do that but yeah. it was Dif really good different times <laughs> yeah right <laughs> yeah uh, when, when you see a lot of these really public missions go on like captain phillips bin laden uh all those things do, do you and the other seals feel proud to be associated with that or is a part of you like god i wish i was just involved in that mission um 
I would love to have been involved in both of those missions. I know guys that were involved in both of those missions. Um, and you know, there's, there's, it's interesting in, when I was in the SEAL teams, when I saw people come out and say political things about it, I was angry with them because they teach us in the SEAL teams that do not advertise the nature of your work. Mm. I'm not in the SEAL teams anymore. I can tell people what I do. But when I was in the SEAL teams, I didn't, I never mm. almost ever said that I'm, I'm a Navy SEAL. I'm in the Navy. I do Navy stuff. And, uh, and so I've changed my perspective on how I represent myself and how I do, but I always represent the SEAL teams in the highest regard, you know, not to um, ever, uh, what am I looking for? Individual credit rather than the team? Well, it's all individual and it's all team. I mean, you, 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 you never put the team, like, I'm better than the team, like, yeah. I'm only here because of the SEAL teams, like yeah. because of the, you know, the great work that the SEAL teams have done. Mm. Um, there, no, there's zero organization in the world that is successful because of an individual. Like I said, we'll just go back to Boat Crew 3. There were no superstars in that crew. We were all regular Joes, but we all wanted to be, we had a different mindset. Yeah. We wanted to suffer in the front. Yeah. Mm. Uh you retired after 26 years of service in the in the Navy SEALs. How did you know it was time to, to move on? And, and what do you miss most about in that career? The Navy said it was time for me to move on. They only let you stay in the military for a certain amount of time. I would still be in there right now. Here's your broom. Um, go back to Japan. and <laughs> Right. Yeah. Can I go through buds again? I'll do. I don't, I don't care. I, yeah. Um, because, again, it was like just part of the, the team, the com camaraderie the mission, the purpose, you know, I woke up every morning, I knew exactly what I was going to do. I knew why I was going to do it. I knew who I was going to do it with. Mm. When I retired, and I use air quotes, because I don't never retired, <laughs> um, just transitioned to different occupations. Um, I, I had to figure out what that was. Mm. Um, yeah, so I would absolutely go back in, into the SEAL teams right now. I mean, it's a little weird politically, and there's some different restrictions that are going on. Uh, there's no real, actually, I was going to say there's no real active combat operations, but there are operations going on all over the world right now. Um, just in a different, a little bit of a different capacity, but still, you can certainly still go in, out there and do great things, and you can certainly go out there and, and not come home mm -hmm. based on, you know, things that we're still doing. So... Uh, I would absolutely go back and, and do it. I, they would loved every second of what I was doing, even when I was miserable. I still loved it. What are the biggest lessons you took from that career that you've been able to apply in business? Um, golly, there's there's so many. Uh, I think, you know, I, I have this this get naked mindset. And and uh, like I said in the beginning, naked is an acronym. And the, so in it stands for never quit. I don't mean ne never quit smoking or drinking or things like that. I mean, <laughs> never quit on yourself. Never quit trying to improve where you are. Uh, the A is accept failure because failure has been the biggest teacher of my life, bar none. If you said, I'll give you a million dollars, I'll give you $10 million uh, if you, you know, you never have any of those failures again and you take them. I would say you keep your money, I'll make my $10 million over here. <laughs> um, through failure. Uh, the A, the A is accept failure. The K is kill mediocrity because I think we're so, we're okay with the status quo. We're okay with good enough. And in business and in life, and if you learn how to, you know, kill the mediocrity that you have in your life, and I think it's because it's easy to do, like how easy is it to get stuck scrolling on social media and TikTok and whatever, and like just be okay with good enough. Yeah. There's a time where good enough is good enough. Like I know, I know people who will nuke something to such a level and then never like produce the content or never launch the business or no, because they want to like make everything perfect. Yeah. At that point, a 80% solution is good enough. Yeah. A 20% solution is probably not good enough. So I kind of think I want to do it, but I don't really want to do it. So I'm not going to do it. Uh, and that's just that mediocre attitude, or I'm going to let someone else do it for me. Mm -hmm. Just do it yourself and let's go. Mm -hmm. uh, the E is expose your fears. And I'm not talking lions and tigers and bears. I mean, those fears that live in the back of your brain that you don't want to share with anyone. Those fears that keep you up at night. Those conversations or arguments maybe that you have with yourself when you're alone in your car mm -hmm. or they wake you up or that keep you um, 
from attacking your goals and, and achieving the things that you want in your life. Uh, so being able to expose those fears, there's lots of ways to do it. And the D is to do the work. Again, going back to you know, sort of that instant gratification. And, uh, and this was a, a mindset that I came up with. Um, you know, when I got out of the military, I had all this like negative self-talk, mm -hmm. a lot of baggage. I call it baggage. And what I had to do is at some point I had to like take that, do something about it. And CBD was a modality that helped turn this noise down in my head. And so that's why I started Naked Warrior Recovery was because CBD had a, such a positive impact on my life. Uh, I wanted to produce the highest quality CBD on the planet. So uh, as CBD helped turn down the noise in my head, I was able to have better positive self-talk. And then from there, you know, I came up with sort of the get naked mindset, which is that never quit, accept failure, kill mediocrity, expose your fears and do the work. And, uh, and it's really about, it's like taking your ego off and being brave enough mm -hmm. to be vulnerable so that you can find the healing. Because I think that we are too afraid to tell anyone that we're afraid or that we're scared or that we need help. And I think that takes more courage than, than pretty much anything. That's one of the hardest things I've ever done in my life. Mm. And I've done some pretty hard things and been in some scary places. And just being vulnerable enough to ask for help was, has been a game changer. I can imagine that would be such a hard thing to do for a yeah. lot. Obviously, unbelievable, critical, obviously, right. absolutely critical, but very difficult for sort of alphas or, or people who are in 100%. law enforcement or, or those things. Is there a particularly dark day where you realize, look, enough is enough. I've got to go and, and go down this, this route? I don't know that there was one specific day. There was, I, I do know the day that I, you know, first tried CBD. I didn't notice anything when I tried it. But what I noticed is over like, the 30 days or so that I used the product that, you know, I, I like to say water boils at 212 degrees and I was probably living my life at 210 degrees mm -hmm. on a daily basis. So it didn't take much to hit that boiling point. Mm -hmm. And what I noticed is over time, I went from like 210 to 205 to 200 to 195 to 190, maybe 185. I got out of that red zone. Mm -hmm. So my fuse was longer. I had like still these triggers would kick in and I would still be angry, but I had more time to and self-awareness to react, or I'm sorry, respond mm. rather than react mm. to whatever those triggers were. And this, you mentioned 210 degrees there. This was after you had retired as well. Yeah. You're just in civilian life. So yeah, a lot yeah. of that stuff could just sneak up on you. Yeah, and it's, and it's not only, and as I've gone down this road, I've found that it's not just you know special operators that have issues. Yeah. First responders, stay-at-home moms, yeah. I, people in just, bad toxic relationships mm. have these same issues but they don't want to put their stuff out there in the world they want to they think they can fix it mm. they think they can outperform whatever that thing is mm. it's not worth it's not worth the effort it's not worth the the pain sometimes it's better to just you know face the face the pain and like rip the rip the band-aid off <laughs> instead of trying to pull it off slowly or trying to keep it on. Yeah, especially if it's impacting a lot of people, partners, children, right. family members, yeah. all, all types of things. 100%. Uh, quality transparency is such a big thing for you with your company. We've actually got some of these here as well. Let's yeah. hold these up for the, for the camera. Uh, Naked Warrior Recovery, amazing stuff. Quality and transparency, how do you focus on, uh, on making sure that they are, you know, you do have the highest quality and, and maintain that transparency throughout the manufacturing process? So we, we do independent third-party testing twice so when the when the oil is extracted from the the hemp plant we send it off to an independent third-party lab to make sure it's high quality there's no pesticides herbicides it's you know it's all usda certified organic um but we still test it anyway and then we we take the oil we run it through the manufacturing process to make gummies to make energy drinks to make the tinctures to make topicals and then we take that final product and we send that off to another independent third-party lab and have them test the the product to make sure that it actually has what it what we say it has in it and um to make sure there was no contamination in the manu manufacturing process and then we put a qr code on the back of it so every batch of of products that we make we you know we 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 put the lab testing online so you can go in and you can see exactly what you're putting into your body because mm -hmm. if you're putting something into your body that's you know maybe has heavy metals and you know, toxins and things like that. You, you don't want to be putting, if you're putting something in your body to be a medicine, you don't want to be putting a bunch of toxins and poisons in your body at the same time, yeah. which is kind of a big problem because hemp is a bioaccumulator. It 
you know, it pulls all the good stuff out of the soil, but it also pulls all the bad stuff out of the soil. Mm. It's such a powerful bioaccumulator that they're using hemp at Chernobyl to clean the radiation out of the soil wow. to, uh, you know, to maybe repopulate that area one day. So you don't want any Chernobyl CBD for sure. <laughs> no, no, you don't. Uh, and I tell you what, it is a it is a rabbit hole going down like misleading labels and things, right. isn't it? Like even the ones uh, I, I've seen like from from like leading brands who make all these big claims on their products, they're not independently verified, and right. all these there's no transparency around the manufacturing process. And it's a it's like a it's a very saturated market. You can find CBD store on just about every corner of America. Mm. And, and I have people like, they will ask me like, well, what's the difference between your product and like that product or the, the product I can get in the, in the, uh, in the, in the gas station. Mm. And, and so my reply is, so what's the difference between gas station sushi and the sushi that you get in a, <laughs> like in a sushi a house? Nobu or something, yeah. Right? You know, <laughs> why do you want to roll the bones with gas station sushi? Why would you roll the bones with gas station CBD? There is a difference. Yeah. Especially when mental health and, and right. well being and all that on there, it's so important. Yeah. Uh, any wins that stand out since you've created the company or even some transformations that you've been able to to help for people along the way? Obviously, you've, you've mentioned your own transformation, which right. has been huge, but yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, certainly my transformation. And, you know, we, we just went through this whole global pandemic, coronavirus-y thing. What that did is that forced me to slow down and do a little more inward work. Help me come up with the Get Naked Mindset. And if you want the Get Naked Mindset, you can go to 5sealsecrets.com. Uh, to get it, just put your name and email in there. I'll I'll send you a, a PDF of it. Uh, I'll eventually turn that into a book mm. uh, with more lessons learned and and some cool stories and things like that. But it has also allowed me to find opportunities to get on stage and speak to people and help impact people's lives. Um, you know, even just this event that I was at this past weekend, I had so many people on Instagram you know, kind of going back to that imposter syndrome, I'm like, I don't know if I did a good job or not. And like, I had people from, I think I had a guy from, from Australia, I'd have to go back and, and uh, confirm. But he was like, that's the most impactful speech I've ever heard in my life. Mm -hmm. And I had so many people say that I was like, really, I don't, I, thank you. <laughs> I don't know that I did a great job. But I you know, sometimes I stutter, I'm afraid of public speaking, <laughs> I may mess up. I tell people a lot of times when I get up and, and I speak on stage that I'm more comfortable in a gunfight than I am talking <laughs> to people in public, because I don't know why I'm, I'm trained to do that. I'm not trained to like, stand in front of a bunch of people and and a bunch of strangers and, and tell them stories. Jerry Seinfeld had that quote where it's like, uh, it's Public speaking is the number one fear. More people would rather be in the coffin than giving the eulogy. Yeah, hundred <laughs> percent. I think that's that's very true. And so some of that's like exposing my own fears. I have a fear of public speaking. Let's let's do it. Let's create a a you know a keynote and and deliver that to as many yeah. people as possible. Yeah, I want to make sure we're really specific on this because it's so important, especially after what's been happening in the last two and a half years with with COVID. A lot of people out there have, have been struggling. Uh, I think a lot of the, the problems here is is people self-medicating, domestic violence, depression. A lot of things have happened behind the scenes as a result of, of COVID. Um, for people who don't go and use something like CBD, like your products, mm -hmm. or for people who don't um, become upfront about the baggage that they're carrying or some of the things they're struggling with or seeking that help, that is when they go and do things like alcohol and prescription drugs. And that was the route that you were on, wasn't it? For yeah, 100%. So I would pretty much, I would use alcohol to turn the noise down or to dull out the noise uh, so that I could go to sleep. And if you kind of phrase it a little bit differently, I would drink and then I would have another drink and then another drink. And then I, pretty much I was just drinking until I fell asleep or until I passed out depending how you phrase it, mm -hmm. uh, how, how you're framing that. But yeah, I think that's true for, for everyone. And I think, you know, I, I have a, a sleep product that I pretty much rely on uh, without question. I stress out a little bit when I run out of my own product. I'm like, <laughs> oh my God, to get more. Um, because I, I'm a, you know, a creature of habit. And sometimes I feel like I need to have that alcohol to like, mm. if I'm not, you know, I missed that. So for me, this is just my own personal story is I'm a little bit ADD and FOMO and some other stuff going on. And, and I'll be working later at night when I should be going to bed, or maybe I'll watch one more YouTube video. And so I like I have this sleep product. And, uh, and it has some melatonin, CBD and CBN in it. CBD is the sedative molecule in the hemp plant. And I'll take it about an hour before I'm ready to go to bed. And then I'll hit that point where I'm like, I'm, I'm tired. 
but if I, I'll like, let me finish this thing I'm working on, or like, let me watch one more video of whatever, or <laughs> just something stupid like that. And I push through that tiredness and then I'm on my second wind and I'm up until one or two or three in the morning. I'm like, oh, maybe I should have a drink to like calm back down. Yeah. And then that doesn't work. And I end up back in, in the same downward spiral. Yeah. So uh, with the sleep product, I take it about an hour before I go to bed, a little bit after dinner. And then like once I hit that tiredness, I can never like recover and get that second wind. It's awesome. And so I'm like, okay, stupid, go to bed. <laughs> so we got some questions now from the win the day community. We had so many come in, so I've tried to pick the best from here. Uh, and if you would like to ask a question and find out what guests we have coming up on the show, make sure you join the win the day group on Facebook. Very first question comes from Nathan in Sydney. What are your tips for disconnecting and unwinding from the harsh components of the job? That's a good question. The answer is to be able to disconnect sometimes. And I, I'll give you just a quick story on how I did it in SEAL training once upon a time is, you know, hell week. You have breakout, which is like the first hour or two, and it's just like guns and explosions, and they're telling you to do all these things, and it's just absolute chaos, and they're trying to replicate combat. And, you know, someone, one of the, the guys that had already been through hell week, but he was injured and he was, you know, recovering so he could join back in the next class, he said, while you're in hell week, like during that breakout se session, at some point, step off to the side, stop and look around and see what's going on. And I was like, okay, check. That seems cool. And then at some point I remembered that. I like, one of the instructors was like, go hit the surf. And so I grabbed a swim buddy and I let my boat crew leader know, hey, I'm gonna go hit the surf. I'll let you know when we get back. And so, and I'm taking James with me. Mm -hmm. So when we run down and we hit the surf and we come back, hey, we're back. And instead of me like going back and start doing eight count bodybuilders or whatever silly thing they were having us do, yelling, I just kind of stopped and I looked around. And I was like, holy crap. They're like, the, you know, it's, you know, the, the building around the, the Bud's compound, it, it's like two stories and there are balconies outside. It was full of people. I had no idea all those people were there. I could like, I like was looking at people. And then I looked at all the chaos that was going on and I was like, oh, this is cool. Mm -hmm. So just taking a, the, the, a, a second, a minute to stop looking completely into the chaos that you're in if you can find a way to just like step back remove yourself from the chaos mentally and think about it like look around and see what's actually going on in you know and i see this in in businesses because i do a little bit of business and leadership uh coaching and i see the employees they're so involved in what's going on with them and they have no they're like we should be doing this and this and this and they they don't stop to ask why the business is doing the things that the business is doing. And, you know, but leaders at the top, they need to be aware of what's going on with the people, their employees and what's going on with the employees and why they're happy or unhappy or whatever, and get down to that kind of deck plate level. This is why we're doing this. I understand that you have concerns about this, but this is why we're doing it. And, and you know, if we can have some sort of compromise in the middle, we will, but, but you have to be able to, it's hard to say, don't be emotionally involved because you're going to be emotionally involved. But if you can find a way to detach and just be a little less emotional and look at it from a different perspective, say, what if, what if it were me, then I think it'll be a little easier to, to do that and then awareness and presence like you mentioned there gee it's such a big thing isn't it like life right. is so fast you blink and you you'll miss it you wake up we, one day we're, and... only, we're only looking at this i'm only looking at like what the <laughs> what the, everyone else around me is doing i'm not really actually looking at the full picture yeah like the bird's eye view right yeah uh gerald in southern california asked what qualities or attributes would you say that you've accumulated during your military career would help leaders in the private sector or even in law enforcement that's a broad question. Um, I think on the leadership side, really listening to what your people have to say. You know, I, I, I talk about, you know, these five seal secrets of, of leadership. And one of those is a, is a decentralized command and control, which is why we're very effective on the battlefield, where me as a leader, I will train you on how to do your job very, very well. And I'd say, go do that, kind of this commander's intent, go do that. And, 
you don't need to report back to me. I don't need to tell you how to do it. You already know how to do it. Mm. You just let me know if you need help, if you need additional support. Then you can focus on that and I can focus on the other things that I need to focus on. Mm. Um, m- many leaders are, they, they either don't train their people how to do that and then when the people fail, they're like, why did you fail? You should have done this, you should have done that. Oh, you didn't tell me how to do it in the first place. So I think first is to train your people how to do it and then trust them to go and do that. Trust and verify. Um, and once they're at a certain level, then you just give them your intent and they will go in and execute it. Um, but you have to leave your kind of crystal palace that you, like many leaders in organizations live in and go down and like see what the actual true uh, the ground truth is for operations. Some of the best leaders I saw in the military, you know, they left their the safety of the headquarters and they would go out and see things that were actually happening on the battlefield. Mm-hmm. It's great that you're telling me about it. I need to go see it for myself. And they yeah. would go on missions and maybe be in gunfights. And, mm-hmm. you know, their job is not to be in gunfights, but they need to see the ground truth of really what's going on. Not for the press, but to actually see. Right, so, so they, they can, can make, make better decisions. decisions. Yeah, yeah. Huge. as a leader. Mm. Uh, Tim and Gladson in Australia asked, when you're feeling flat, have you found anything that can quickly get you motivated again? Uh, I just put in some hardcore music and mm-hmm. get after it. Any particular bands that are, that are your favorite? I'm, I'd have to find my phone. I know like the songs, <laughs> I can't tell you the, the artists. Afterwards, yeah. I'd love to see what's on your playlist. Yeah, right. Mine's random. It skips through a bunch of, you know, different, yeah. different things, but uh, there'll be some embarrassing ones. Like some, some like ones. probably like hardcore rap something, <laughs> yeah. um, like 50 Cent, Dr. Dre, Eminem, <laughs> whatever. Uh, and then it just kind of goes on from there. Yeah. Music's such a big uh, emotional it, builder, it, isn't it? It For sure. hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and final question from Lindsay in Houston. What's the best way to show support and gratitude to a veteran? Just tell them thank you. Yeah. Mm. Um, Which is super, like when people tell me that, I'm like, I'm like kind of a little bit embarrassed, but I'm like, thank you. <laughs> thank, I mean, really. <laughs> uh, you've mentioned uh, before, obviously, part of this with, with Navy SEALs is earning your trident every day. Can yeah. you talk a little bit about that mentality? So that's, you know, that's really about doing the work. I, you know, when I... It's, it's funny, when I went through SEAL training, we didn't have that that um, slogan mm. yet. Uh, it wasn't until we started deploying to combat and guys were coming back and they would like perform really well on the battlefield, but then they would get back and they would, they were, there was a lot of other things going on, but you know, they'd get in trouble, maybe DUIs and things like that, bar fights, and because they're trying to decompress from things that went on. Mm. And so, you know, a bunch of the leadership got together and they came up with, you know, the, 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 the seal creed, uh, and you know, the slogan of earn your trident every day. And really what that means is just because you're not at work, you're still, you still need to earn that. You still need to like, from your actions, from how you live your life, whether you're in the seal teams or not in the seal teams, whether you're deployed or not deployed, Mm -hmm. how you live your life, you should always be earning that thing that you wear on your chest. You only, you don't only wear it, you only, you know, wear it in like when you're in your shiny uniform, you should be wearing it when you're wearing civilian clothes. You should be wearing it, earning it when you're, you know, you know, the way that you uh, are in a relationship at home, when you're the way that you act when you're out in town and you're, or you're on Liberty or things like that, Mm -hmm. or when you're in the heat of battle, like be proud of who you are at the end of the day, Mm -hmm. because, you know, there's another saying that we have that says the only easy day was yesterday. And, so that whole earn your trident every day when I graduated SEAL training, I maybe didn't have that. I was like, oh, I graduated the hardest military training in the world. It's going to be easy from here on out. And I couldn't have been more wrong because when I showed up at the SEAL teams, I learned very quickly that they don't care about the fact that you graduated SEAL training. They you're care now about the base level. Yeah. You're right. They the... <laughs> care about what you're doing today and how you're performing. And that was kind of what we talked about a little bit earlier is that, um, you know, that accountability piece, like I show up and maybe I'm feeling a little off. They're going to, you know, even my guys that were junior to me that worked for me, they're like, you need to pick it up today. Mm. I'm like, yep, you're right. Check. <laughs> and if I would do exactly the same thing to them. If they were like a little bit down, they weren't performing the way that they should. What's up? Let's, let's get it on. So, yeah. And so we, we, we held each other accountable, but we're expected to earn that trident every single day in everything that we do, no matter where we are 
in our life. Yeah, it sounds like there's no individual ego there. It's just a group standard right. that you have that accountability for. Right. Mm. Uh, how does someone recapture a sense of purpose or mission after a major life change, like a transition to civilian life or um, divorce, career change, that type of thing? I think this, it's a little bit of a canned answer, potentially. Um, it, it depends, but what you need to do is figure out, and it, it's, so this is gonna take work. Mm -hmm. It's gonna take effort, it's gonna take tenacity. And what you think your purpose is today may not be your purpose of tomorrow. So as you work on what that purpose is, what that new mission is, what that new, uh, the thing that you wanna do in your life is, it could pivot. You may have like a, 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 a plan of what you wanna do, an end goal, you may not hit that end goal. You may actually find the on your path to try and get there, and it's not going to happen overnight. It's not instant gratification. You're going to end up pivoting and doing something else that's even more rewarding and more you know more powerful. Um, it certainly has happened to me. I mean, I you know I left the SEAL teams. I was super depressed, and then I was like, oh, I'm going to start a CBD company. Then I'm going to do some other stuff. I never in my life have I ever wanted to do public speaking, coaching, or anything like that. But through this process of, I started a CBD, I started another consulting company, um, which was my goal when I got out, but I didn't, that wasn't, I didn't like doing that. Um, just for various reasons. But as I've, you know, pivoted, like my, now I, all I want to do is I want to, I want to public speak. I want to get on big stages. I want to coach people in improving their lives, building them up as leaders uh, and changing their mindset mm. and making the world a better place. Mm. Like that was nothing I ever wanted to do. I was trying to make the world a better place through different means once upon a time, <laughs> just as a cog in the wheel. I want to be a major contributing factor to people's lives yeah. now. Yeah. You know, there's a quote from Steve Jobs. You can never connect the dots looking forwards. You can only connect them looking back. Right. And it sounds like you've experienced a bit of that too. Yeah. Mm. Still figuring those dots out. Yeah. Yeah. Aren't we all? <laughs> uh, last question before we move into the rocket round. On your best day, what's an affirmation that you would write on a flash card to show yourself on your worst day? Keep going. You got this. Mm. You're better than you think you are. Mm. Oh Well, let's now move into the win the day rocket round. 10 questions, just some quick answers. You up for this one? Let's do it. <laughs> Number one, what quote inspires you the most? Man in the arena. Mm. You want me to give it to you? Absolutely. If you got it, I love the it. The way. So my, my daughter, who's, she'll be, she's eight years old right now. We say this on the way to school every day. And it goes something like this. The poorest way to face a life is to face it with a sneer. There are many men who feel a kind of twisted pride and cynicism. There are many who confine themselves to the criticism of the way others do what they themselves dare not even attempt. There is no more unhealthy being, no man less worthy of respect than he who either really holds or feigns to hold an attitude of sneering disbelief to all that is great and lofty, whether in achievement or in that noble effort where even if he fails comes the second achievement. It isn't the critic who counts. It isn't the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man or woman who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives gallantly, who errors, who comes short again and again because there is no effort without error and shortcoming, but who does actually strive to do the deeds, who knows great enthusiasms, the great devotions, who spends himself in a worthy cause, who at the best in the end knows the triumph of high achievement. And at worst, even if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly, so that his fate shall never be with those cold and timid souls who neither know victory nor defeat. Again, that was Teddy Roosevelt's man in the arena. Love it. So good. That is by far, the, no offense to all our previous guests, that is by far the best answer that we have had <laughs> now on this show. Uh, brilliant. So good, isn't it? Did you see me mess up right there? I was like, oh God, it flew right out of my head. You owned it though. That happened it? to me on stage once upon a time. I was like, oh, <laughs> hold on. 
I'm accepting failure right now. I'll get it back though. <laughs> Don't you worry. A real time adjustment. We've got three <laughs> cameras here and a bunch going on. So easy thing that can happen. Uh, number two, a much easier question. Morning coffee or evening wine? Morning coffee. Number three, what's one bit of advice you would give your 18 year old self? Don't shoot for the minimum standard. Always try to crush the standard. Mm, great lesson. Number four, what book do you gift the most? I think either Winning or Relentless by Tim Grover. Tim Grover. Mm. Number five, was there a vulnerability you once hid within that became your superpower? Imposter syndrome. Mm. Number six, what's one thing you've learned about failure? That's worth more than $10 million. <laughs> <laughs> Accept that failure and keep moving. It make It's like, make it your teacher. Mm -hmm. Number seven, if you could sit on a park bench and have a conversation with someone alive or dead, who would it be? My dad. Number eight, what tool or resource best helps you run your life or your business? Uh, either my calendar or my business coaches. Number nine, share one thing on your bucket list. To do a million dollars a year in profit. Number 10, what's one thing you do to win the day? I start the night before. Love it. So simple, but so good, isn't it? Right. <laughs> That's great. There are a bunch of ways to connect with Will, and we'll link to all of these in the show notes. You can follow him on Instagram at Naked Warrior Recovery. Check out the full range of Naked Warrior products at nw-recovery.com and download his five seal secrets at fivesealsecrets.com. Again, all of that and more will be linked in the show notes. William, great to see you. Thanks so much Thank for coming so on much. the show. I hope you enjoyed that interview. As you heard, our guests love to hear positive feedback no matter where they're at in their careers. So share a comment on the YouTube version of this episode with your favorite takeaway so our guests know they made a difference in your life today. If you're a business owner and want a copy of the 10 biggest mistakes business owners make with their podcast, go to mistakes.wearepodcast.com or click the link in the show notes. It's a free download and we'll show you everything you need to do to start getting a massive ROI from your podcast so you can help a lot more people, get recognized as the authority in your industry and scale your business faster than ever. And if you haven't already, hit the subscribe or follow button so you can get access to episodes like this one as soon as they are released. The Win The Day podcast is available on Spotify, Apple, YouTube, and wherever you listen to podcasts. Finally, the right bit of inspiration can completely change the trajectory of someone's life. So if there's a friend or loved one out there who needs to hear this episode or could use some help to win the day, share it with them right now. That's all for this episode. Get out there and win the day. Until next time, onwards and upwards, always.